गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो दिस इज माई नेक्स्ट लेक्चर बेस्ड ऑन स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम टेक्निक्स विच इज इन इंक्लूडेड इन द सब्जेक्ट दैट इज डिजिटल कॉम्युनिकेशन हैविंग कोड सिक्स के ई सी सिक्स जीरो वन सो इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू सी हाउ द नैरो बैंड सिग्नल्स आर डिफरेंट फ्रॉम स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम और वाइड बैंड सिग्नल्स एंड वॉट आर द डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम टेक्निक्स एंड हाउ दीज टेक्निक्स विल बी एडवांटेजेस इन वेरियस एप्लीकेशन इन डे टू डे लाइफ सो वॉट इज स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम कॉम्युनिकेशन सो अ कलेक्टिव क्लास ऑफ सिग्नलिंग टेक्निक्स आर एम्प्लॉयड बिफोर ट्रांसमिटिंग अ सिग्नल टू प्रोवाइड अ सिक्योर कॉम्युनिकेशन नोन एज द स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम मॉडुलेशन सो विद दिस टेक्निक वी कैन प्रोवाइड अ सिक्योर कॉम्युनिकेशन बिटवीन द ट्रांसमीटर एंड द रिसीवर सो द मेन एडवांटेज ऑफ स्प्रेड स्पेक्ट्रम कॉम्युनिकेशन टेक्निक इज टू प्रिवेंट इंटरफ्रेंस वेदर इट इज इंटेंशनल और अन इंटेंशनल सो द सिग्नल्स मॉडुलेटेड विद दीज टेक्निक्स आर हार्ड टू इंटरफेयर एंड कैन नॉट बी जैम्ड एंड इंक्लूडर विथ एन ऑफिशियल एक्सेस ओनली कैन बी यूज दीज सिग्नल and uh, the officials which are not uh, having uh, the uh, uh, official access then and these they cannot be cracked them and hence these techniques are basically used for military applications so here what we are going to do we just uh, uh, widen uh, the signal the narrow band signal so that it comes uh, be below the noise floor and uh, the extruder or the intruder from uh, or the from the enemy side cannot be interfere cannot be easily interfere these type of signals so these spread spectrum signals transmit at low power density and has a wide spread of signals so these are some properties of the spread spectrum communication so to provide secure communication between transmitter and receiver we can use this these techniques and uh, obviously these uh, techniques are very much useful as th these cannot be interfere or jam with any of the intruder or the extruder either it have some official access or not no, with no official access so a uh, term here which, which we uh, define here that is pseudo noise sequence so basically uh, for the spread spectrum technique or spread spectrum communication we use these pseudo noise sequences these these sequences are basically a coded sequence of ones and zeros with certain auto correlation properties so here uh, these sequence are called as pseudo noise coding sequence or pn sequence and it is used in spread spectrum technique so it is a maximum length sequence which is a type of cyclic code so here we define or differentiate between narrow band and spread spectrum signals so we can easily see both the narrow band and spread spectrum signals can be understood easily by observing their frequency spectrum as shown in the below figures narrow band signals are have the signal strength concentrated as shown in the following frequency spectrum figure so we can see from the spectrum here these two spectrums are uh, for the narrow band and for the spread spectrum signals for the narrow band we have concentrated energy here less widen for the wide band it is more widen and psd is very low here psd is high so here uh, we can see easily the difference between narrow band signals and obviously wide band or spread spectrum signal it has concentrated energy in a particular fixed uh, at a particular fixed frequency or it has uh, very high psd power spectral density it is very less widen because its bandwidth is very less and uh, similarly we can uh, see from the figure of the spread spectrum signal that it is more widen having less psd it is very less as uh, below the noise floor uh, so obviously when it is very less beyond the noise floor obviously the enemies or the extruder from the other side will not interfere with these type of signals which is spread spectrum signal that's why these signals are used in military applications so we can see here there are some points uh which we can discuss here for the, for the narrow band signal that is band of signals occupy a narrow range of frequencies here power density is very high spread of energy is low and concentrated the other features are very good these signals are prone to interference so we see that these have high power spectral density uh, very narrow range of frequencies spread of energy is very low and concentrated but these features are very obviously these features are very good but these signals are very prone to interference so easily these signals can be interfered with the enemy signals or or it can be easily jammed 
So, spread spectrum signals, the spread spectrum signals have the signal strength distributed as shown in the below figure and obviously these have very less PSD, more widened, but these cannot be interfered easily or these are very prone to uh, un interference. So, here now we will going to discuss what are the different types of spread spectrum techniques. So, how we can define these types uh, on the basis of uh, some modulation techniques which we have already discussed in the previous lectures. So, basically we have three types of modulation schemes which are uh, the basic ones that is amplitude shift king, phase shift king and the frequency shift king. So, categorizing all these uh, modulation techniques we define there are two types of spread spectrum techniques which is FHSS and DSS which is frequency hoped, FHSS is frequency hoped spread spectrum. So, here the frequency are hoped and next one is the DSSS, DSSS is basically direct sequence spread spectrum. So, in the DSSS we, which, uh, we can use the modulation techniques like ASK and BPSK. In FHSS which is frequency hope spread spectrum technique we, we use majorly BFSK that is binary phase shift uh, frequency shift king. So, spread spectrum multiple access uses signals which have a transmission bandwidth of a magnitude greater than the minimum required RF bandwidth. There are two types of uh, spread spectrum techniques. First one is the frequency hope spread spectrum which is FHSS and the second one is the direct sequence spread spectrum which is DSSS. So, now we are going to discuss about how direct sequence spread spectrum techniques work and how these, these techniques are used, this technique is useful for uh, military applications. So, whenever a user wants to send data using this DSSS technique, each and every bit of the user will be multiplied with a chipping code or a secret code. So, this chipping code is nothing but it is a spreading code uh, which is multiplied with the original message and then it will be transmitted to the receiver. The receiver uses the same code to retrieve the original message. So, we have here a kind of a code which is multiplied with the data before getting it into a modulated and then these this modulated signal with this particular code is which is a which is called as a chipping code is sent through a channel and it will be transmitted uh, to the uh, receiver. And the receiver knows the that chipping code and it will again multiply the data whatever the modulated signal is obtained at the receiving pa part is multiplied with the chipping code again and there is a property of the chipping code. So, if the chipping code is defined as CT, so when we multiply CT two times that is at the transmitter side and at, at, at the receiver side, we will get it unity that is 1. So, it has a property that is C square t is equal to 1. So, if the receiver again multiply the with the chipping code the data or the modulated signal then we will have the c square t term will be 1 and we will uh, obtain only the uh, residual part that is your original message signal then it will be demodulated and will be filtered out all these all the uh, higher frequency components and then we will get the original message the original data which is transmitted through the transmitter. So, now we will discuss how the block diagram of this direct sequence spread spectrum works. So, here we have a multiplier circuit. So, this is your multiplier at which we have two types of things here. First one is the user data which is defined as empty and the second one is the chipping data. So, at the multiplier we have two inputs. First is the user data which is empty and the chipping sequence CT. This two data, uh, these two things will be multiplied together and then we will get a spread spectrum signal which is yt is equal to mt into ct. At the modulator, we have all, all already defined the modulate, modulation schemes that is which we can use here at the direct sequence spread spectrum that is BASK and BPSK. Both these schemes we can use at the modulation technique. And with the help of the radio carrier, the data will be modulated and then transmitted through a channel. So, here at the channel, the data is transmitted. Next, we have at the receiver. So, the, at the receiver, we have uh, the received signal, which is the modulated one, modulated signal. But 
with some chipping code. This modulated signal is again demodulated with the help of the radio carrier. Then again we have a multiplier circuit which will multiply the demodulated signal with the chipping sequence. So here we will get demodulated signal and it will be multiplied with the chipping sequence. And then obviously we have the property C square T is equal to 1 as we have at the transmitter there is 1 CT and the, at the receiver there is 1 CT. So obviously this part becomes 1 only we will left with the demodulated data. Then that data will be passed through the integrator circuit or a uh, low pass filter or a decision making circuit. So we have an integrator circuit and then we have a decision making circuit. At the decision making circuit we have uh, some threshold. Lambda suppose. So, with this value whatever here after the integrator whatever the value will come it will be compared with the uh, lambda value. If this value is greater than lambda then we will have the output 1. If this value is lesser than lambda then we will have the output 0. So, the part which is uh, the multiplier and the integrator circuit is called as correlator which is very important term here. So, the correlator is the combination of the multiplier circuit with the chipping sequence and the integrator circuit. Whatever the data output uh, through the integrator comes out that to be fed into a decision making circuit and with the help of decision making or a threshold value lambda will uh, do a some decision of the, of the binary data whether it will be a 1 or whether it will be a 0. So, if the output of the integrator is greater than as I have discussed it that the output of the integrator if it is greater than lambda it will be 1 if, if the output of the uh, integrator is less than uh, lambda then it will be 0. So, we have secure and jamming resistance both receiver and transmitter must know here the CT this is the important thing because if the receiver does not know about CT how it can how it can uh, demodulate uh, the original data or, uh, or we, how it will receive the uh, original data. So, since PSD is very low hard to tell if signals present here since wide response tough to jam everything. So, these are some properties of this, this DSSS or the direct sequence spread spectrum technique. So, here first thing we both the transmitter and receiver knows the chipping sequence code or the secret code. Since the PSD is very low below the noise floor it will be uh, hard to tell if signal is present here and that is why there is less interference of the uh, extruder or the intruder from the even uh, from the same community the intruder will not easy to interfere these type of signals. Since wide response tough to jam everything multiple access techniques which we can use here because the applications of DSSS is CDMA that is code division multiple access. This is code division. multiple access. So, the application of uh, DSSS is CDMA which is code division multiple access obviously the CDMA have multiple uh, users which will be multiplied with uh, the chipping code and then these will be sent through a common channel or a coaxial cable and then at the receiver again we have a demodulated circuits and uh, for every message which is multiplied with the chipping code that will be demodulated with the help of the demodulation and then again it will be multiplied with the some chipping code which is which we have already multiplied at the receiver side. All the chipping codes are distinct in nature in the case of the CDMA obviously otherwise there will be interference between the two signals and then we will retrieve our original data with the help of this CDMA technique. So, this is very useful technique or it is an application of DSSS. So, if CIT is orthogonal to CJT then users do not interfere. So, obviously there are two chipping codes CIT or CJT both chipping codes should be distinct to each other so that there will be no interference between the user. There is one problem or the drawback of the CDMA which is called as near far problem. So, user must be received with the same power because at the uh, in the case of the CDMA it may be possible that. Uh, all the users does not respond at the receiver with the same power level. So, maybe there will be difference in the power level at the receiver side whatever the transmitted power from the transmitter side will be received what uh, those uh, users which are very near to uh, the trans receiver side they will they will propagate. So, in CDMA the main disadvantage is near far problem.
So here uh, every user does not respond to the same power level at the receiver. So the power levels at the receivers are very different from each other. So we have to see whether the power level is same or we have to uh, organize the power level uh, with the same levels. Otherwise there will be some problem which is called as near far problem. So now we will discuss about frequency hopping spread spectrum. This is frequency hopping technique where the users are made to change the frequencies of usage from uh, one to another in a specified time interval. Hence it is called as frequency hopping technique. For example, if frequency was allotted to sender 1 for a particular period of time, now after a while sender 1 hopes to the other frequency and the sender 2 uses the first frequency which was previously used by sender 1. So this process is called as frequency reuse because we are reusing the frequency of sender 1 to sender 2. So the frequencies of the data are hoped from one to another in order to provide a secure transmission. The amount of time spent on each frequency hope is called as dwell time. So this is an important term which is called as dwell time. So whatever the amount of time spent on each frequency hoping is called as dwell time. So we, here we have uh, basically two types of two versions of hoping. First one is the fast hoping and the second one is the slow hopping. So, in the fast hopping several frequencies per user bit. So, here at uh, in a one bit interval there are several frequencies f1, f2, f3 and f4 and, and so on and in slow hopping several users bits per frequency. So, at one particular frequency there are several bits. So, both these terms are very much different from each other. What is What are the advantages of these hopping techniques? Frequency selective fading and interference limited to shorter period uses only small portion of the spectrum at any time because we are hoping the spectrum or the entire bandwidth of the channel um, with some uh, frequencies. So here the channel is uh, divided into F1, F2, F3 and so on. So obviously it uses only small portion of the spectrum at any time. Whatever the data will be sent from the transmitter to receiver, it will be allocated to some particular frequency slot. Otherwise we are using the entire bandwidth of the uh, channel. With that, with that data. So, that will be the wastage of the uh, bandwidth. So, here this technique is basically uh, fully utilize the bandwidth you can say or the these techniques which is fast hopping and slow hopping obviously this will give you an uh, extraordinary thing of how we can manage the entire bandwidth with this these techniques. So, what is the disadvantage here not as robust as GSSS here. So now we can disc, uh, we can see from the figure here what is slow hopping and what is fast hopping. In the slow hopping we have 3 bits per hope. So we have for a particular frequency range for a F2 because we have F1, F2, F3. So for F2 we have 3 bits 0, 1 and 0 and in the fast hopping we have for a particular frequency for a particular bit we have 3 frequencies. So 0 for 0 we have F1 frequency. F3 frequency and F2 frequency. So, we have 3 frequencies at in a particular bit. So, both these techniques have some advantages, some disadvantages. Either we can use slow hopping, either we can use fast hopping depending on how we, these can be applied into various applications. So, we can discuss now here the FHSS transmitter and receiver. So, in the FHSS we have a already modulated signal whether it will be FSK or BPSK signal and then it will be again modulated with some, some kind of uh, pseudo noise bit source and frequency synthesizer circuit. So, here we have binary data, we have a modulator either it can be FSK or BPSK. Then we have a pseudo noise bit source which is fed into a channel table. Then we have a frequency synthesizer which will give you a hopping kind of thing that is it divides the entire allocated bandwidth into some uh, distinct uh, frequencies that is F1, F2, F3 and so on and then this will be multiplied with a chipping code which is CT then it will be passed through a channel a band pass filter is you can use at the uh, channel side or the at the transmitter side before the channel or after the transmitter side and then it will be sent through a channel. So, here we will send the data through the channel then these this particular data is uh, received at the receiver which is spread spectrum signal obviously ST and then again the reverse process will be done as uh, similar to transmitter side we have a frequency synthesizer circuit it will multiply it with some chipping code a pseudo noise bit source which is fed into a channel table and the band pass filter about different frequency and a demodulator circuit which is FSK or BPSK. 
here then we will get our binary data there is a term which is called as processing gain which is defined by n small n which is entire uh, bandwidth which is capital B or the spread spectrum bandwidth which is BSS. So, it is defined as n is equivalent to BSS upon B or in terms of dB we can calculate 10 log 10 BSSS upon B or in terms of uh, durations or the chipping duration or the uh, bit rate duration or the bit duration it will be defined as bit TB upon chipping duration that is TC. So, we can define n is equivalent to the main formula for n is equivalent to TB upon TC or n is equivalent to FC upon FB in terms of frequency or the data rate or the chipping rate. So, these are some advantages of these spread spectrum techniques following, following uh, other advantages that is cross stock elimination, better output with data integrity, reduced effect of multipath fading, better security, reduction in noise, coexistence with other systems, large operative distances, hard to detect, not easy to demodulate or decode, difficult to jam the signals. Although spread spectrum techniques were originally designed for military users, but nowadays these are used for commercial purposes also. So, we can see here that how the spread spectrum signals are very much more advantages as compared to the normal narrow band signal which are uh, prone to interference and it can be easily jammed. Here we have less crosstalk, better output with data integrity, reduced effect of multipath fading, better security, hard to detect, not easy to de demodulate it. Obviously, this is the dis disadvantage, difficult to jam the signal and better security because whether uh, you know, in militaries, we want the signal to be secured from the transmitter to receiver. Only the transmitter knows the signal and the and the receiver must know the signal. No other one or the intruder or the extruder will uh, identify that particular signal or retrieve that signal. So, these are some basic advantages of the spread spectrum communication. Here we have drawn a uh, plot between the narrow band and the spread spectrum waveform. So, obviously, the spreaded waveform is very much low as be below the noise level and that is why it will be it cannot be easily jammed with some other signals or it cannot be interfered with some other signals. So, there is uh, increasing the signal bandwidth increases the prob probability of uh, correct reception. Spreading the data across the spectrum makes the signal resistance to noise, interference and snooping. So, the signal when spread is embedded in noise, it is assumed that the total power transmitted by the spread is signal is the same as in the original signal. Obviously, the power content in both the signals are same or the energy content is same. Only the energy is concentrated in the case of the narrow band waveform as compared to the spread spectrum waveform. So, this is the again the last figure for this slide that is uh, showing the interference of the spread signal or for the narrow signal. Obviously, here the interference is more, here the interference is very less. Similarly, detection at the receiver, it can be spread interference which is obviously easily detected as compared to the uh, the original the narrow band signal. So, the narrow band signal is easily detected as spread uh, interference we have a chipping code there which will, which will be known only to the receiver and that with the help of that chipping code the receiver will identify the original message signal. So, thank you so much. So, this is all about the spread spectrum techniques which is very useful in nowadays digital communication or in military application and various commercial purposes. We can secure our signal with these type of techniques and then send uh, these uh, signals from the transmitter to the receiver. Thank you so much.